you would please take your Bibles once again and turn to the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Be reading verses 31 through 43. Then he, that is Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. And When the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them, did not, and he rebuking them did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creature. The Apostle Paul would write that you, the Apostle Peter would write that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special people, proclaiming the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. As a people touched by this power, we demonstrate that power in our lives, in our words, in our attitudes, and in our works. To read about the Lord's teaching and actions reminds us of who it is that we serve. We get the description of God manifest in the flesh and how He acted amongst His people, amongst His creation when He was here. And it reminds us of His goodness and of His glory. And it also brings us into a recognition once again of what He continues to do in our lives and in the lives of others. Paul in Galatians 5 would say, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. and Do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Standing fast in the liberty means that we are free to serve that we are free to live without a worry, We're free to live and demonstrate, not fearing what people are going to think, not fearing the type of retribution we're going to have, not fearing the peer pressure that surrounds us and often chokes us and causes us to gasp for air. No, standing fast in the liberty is standing fast in the same power, the same truth, the same goodness, the same authority that we read in these pages. Christ has freed you, Christ has healed you, and Christ has a kingdom of grace for you to live in. It is far and above any other system, any other thing that you could ever live for or delight in. Chapter 4, the Lord is on the scene. The Lord is in the midst. Last week we saw him reading and teaching in the synagogue. He continues to teach in synagogues. We spoke about the way he teaches. 
We spoke about the fact that they are astonished at the Lord Jesus, astonished at who he is, at his, his presence, at his power, at his light, at his truth, at incarnate goodness set before him. Sure, he teaches with authority. Sure, he teaches with clarity. Sure, he teaches with decisiveness and objective universal truth. But all that teaching is also backed up with what he does as well. God's Word is what ultimately combats evil. And as the living Word incarnate, he's going to demonstrate his power and authority to combat evil. We know that he does it on the ultimate spiritual level with crucifixion, death, and resurrection. But he demonstrates that, and he demonstrates his eternal power to do that in his earthly ministry. We see him in chapter 4 casting out unclean spirits. Uh, what, are, what do we mean by unclean spirits or demons? What are they? Well, they are fallen angels. They are the angels, the beings of light, the beings that God had created to be pure servants of him. They don't have souls that bring about salvation, that need salvation. They're not created in the image of God, but from very vague and limited understanding that we have in the Scripture, we understand that a number of them rebelled against God at some point in time. And now, instead of attacking the one they've rebelled against because they can't touch him, they seek to destroy and attack and deceive and thwart and slow down and hamper and crush his image bearers. Why are they so active in the Gospels? Why do they seem to be something that the Lord Jesus and the apostles, even in Acts, are facing at a regular interval? Well, they know the time is at hand. They know that the one is there who ultimately and will finally defeat them and destroy them and cast them into the lake of fire. So as they can only rebel, even if they know that their ultimate end is destruction, they still want to gather the opposition and do what they can just to destroy and to hold back and to thwart and to slow down as many people as God could, would, would save or as many people that have been the glory of God's creation that they want to mar with their deception as much as possible. Do they still exist? Where are they now? Of course, they're still roaming to and fro through all the earth like a lion seeking whom they could devour. Of course, they're still there. Now, in our Western world, they appear more subtle, but still imposing. Wherever deception comes in, wherever light is blocked out, wherever something or someone or some craving or some movement or some philosophy or some emotion holds you back from the love of Christ or holds you back from the peace of God or holds you back from glorying in your Lord, you can be sure that there is some form of evil tempting you and pulling you away from that. Oh, you can't blame them. You're, you're, you're the sinful one. Don't say he made me do it. Don't say the devil made me do it. But certainly the, the voices are there. The temptations are there. The displays are there. The things, the objects. And then, of course, in certain parts of the world, they still act very openly the way they did in, at this time in the gospel period. You speak to missionaries in South America or Africa or even Asia, and you'll hear things that sound just like the gospel accounts. But the Lord Jesus is the one who has the authority to cast them out. The authority of the Lord Jesus, I said, was in his teaching, but also in his action. And in his action, he demonstrates the salvation that he embodies. The only solution to evil of any kind is, of course, the authority of Christ Jesus. They say, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Leave us alone. This attitude is something that should give us pause. When we find ourselves in a situation where we are saying to God, or we are saying to God's people, or we are saying to something that 
demonstrates truth, or that directs us towards righteousness, or that calls us to repentance, or that grows us spiritually, when we say, leave us alone, leave me alone, I'm tired, I can't be bothered now, I can't pay attention, I'm not interested right now, maybe tomorrow, leave me alone, I don't want it. When that is our attitude, when those are our words, take note of what other beings say these words in the face of the Lord Jesus. If you are someone who is annoyed by the Bible, annoyed by spiritual things, and your attitude is, leave me alone, where is that attitude coming from? What is it getting you? How does it help and how does it profit? God Almighty is ultimately the only reason to change the attitude, to change the heart, and to do any good, to do any truth, to do any justice, and to bring any peace into a situation. God Almighty is ultimately the only reason. The authority of God, it not only casts out evil, but is also the only reason to bring any justice or truth. There is no secular argument that is consistent for a world to live in harmony and peace. There just isn't. Oh, you might get one going here or there and get it off the ground a little bit, but pretty soon it'll sputter and run out of gas and crash and burn because there are always too many inconsistencies. There are always too many variables. There are always too many differences of opinion. There are always too many different cultures. There are always too many different ways of life, uh, desires, tastes, secular arguments that call for a unity, that call for a peace, that call for a utopian society cannot, cannot last, cannot stay consistent. Only author the authority of God can do that. When someone tries to tell you how to act, when tr someone tries to tell you about your unsociable behavior, when someone tries to tell you the way you want to be is against the rules or against the law or against the way people are supposed to be, none of, those, none of those decrees can stand up because you can always change the law. You can always change tradition. You can always change the way things are supposed to be. You cannot change the Word of God. And so when you stand fast in Christ's liberty, when you stand fast in His authority, when you stand fast in His Word and in His teaching and in His grace, then you know that you are in the right. And when you're in the right, you can be prepared for the demons to say, get out of here. We don't want you. And so the response must be, thus says the Lord, the God of eternity who has made the sea and the dry land, you who would destroy, you who would tear apart, you who would cause bitterness, you, you who would sow seeds of discord, be gone. You who would throw someone to the ground and cause them uh, to have a, a destructive lifestyle as we see demonstrated amongst possession here in the Gospels, be gone. The Word of God does that. And it still, to this day, is the only way to combat any demonic presence, any demonic activity, any evil. The authority of Christ Jesus, the teaching of His Word, remains the only solution, and the only way, truth and life. What about that cleansing authority for you? We fill ourselves with Christ's and the things of Him. When these forces would try to distract us and to fill us with things that tear us away or things that cause us to fear or things that cause us to tremble or things that consume us that really have no everlasting reward, we remember the cleansing authority of the Lord Jesus for us. When our current suburban situation doesn't enable us to, to even really know our neighbors, and our neighbors want it that way, we cling to Christ and understand that His authority has to change us and enable us to be the people that others envy because of our peace and because of our joy and our contentment and our comfort, not our fear, not our bitterness. When current events try to overcome us and current events 
seem to consume every conversation that we have or seem to consume every action that we make. The cleansing authority of Christ must say, be gone. We cast out these evils and we seek the Lord and His Word. It's a demonstration of salvation that He's doing here and a demonstration of who He is and what He's come to do. Another demonstration that we see throughout the Gospels, and of course we're seeing here, is the healing of the sick. Of course, it's authoritative once again. It's a demonstration that the one who created all things out of nothing and brings order to chaos does it with the body as well as the soul. We know very well, based on Scripture and based on experience, that illness under the curse of sin is ubiquitous and expected. And yet, despite the fact that it's everywhere and it touches everyone, and despite the fact that you can't go through life not expecting to be sick at some point, it still strikes us as tragic. It still stings. We still are unsettled by it. You know, it's all the creation groans and travails in pain waiting for the day when these things will be made right and these illnesses will be taken away. We have an explanation for why there is illness. We understand that sin has brought it in. The curse remains. We can speak of that. The world has no reason for it. For the world, they should not think that is tragic. For the world, it should just be part of life, and they should shrug their shoulders and brush it off as of something of natural, of natural order. But they don't. The tragedy of it is still there because all the creation knows that this is not the way it's supposed to be. The Lord stands in the midst and heals that discomfort from illness. That illness testifies to the truth of the Scripture. And the Lord Jesus is the one who is the only eternal cure. Now, I said last week, we remember that He doesn't heal absolutely every individual in the world when He comes because that's not what He's there to do. He's there to demonstrate and testify to the truth and to preach the kingdom of God, of course. And yes, He's there to die for the sins of the world. And one day all will be made right. But now He testifies. Now He gives a foretaste of the glory divine. Now He demonstrates His authority and He demonstrates that salvation and He heals certain people and He shows that He is the one who is going to bring the ultimate safety, the ultimate healing. He shows what His liberty and salvation do. You can know it on a spiritual plane, but also our only hope physically is in Him as well. The already of the healing that's demonstrated, the already of the peace and salvation and spiritual healing that we have and that we know points to the not yet. And the not yet is the best goal you could ever live for. Why do people in this world so crave a political way to bring about perfection? If we could only pass more laws, if we could only bring in more education, the world could be a perfect place. And the effort is to get rid of the people who hold that back. Why is there such a thirst for that? Well, because for them, there is no not yet. There is no future kingdom. There is no Messiah who's going to make things right. There is no glorious Savior that is outside of self. People of the world have to view themselves as the Savior. And they can't be at peace. They have to always be at war. They have to always be at strife. Because the responsibility lies on their shoulders. Christ comes in and says, peace be still. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the one who's going to make it right. And we live for that future glory, not in fear, not in chaos, not in anger, not in bitterness at those who hold it back, but with the constant, stable, firm, planted, solid grasp that our God will do it in His time and His way. And may He use us to bring His glory measure by measure even now. He heals to demonstrate his salvation. And the current ministry of mercy continues in that same vein. It demonstrates of what we know to be true. 
It demonstrates the goodness of God. It demonstrates the healing of God. It demonstrates the mercy of God. It demonstrates the salvation of God. When you give a, a, a cup of cold water in, a per, in His name, when you go out of your way to help, to provide, you're saying, look, I understand that I have been provided for. I understand that I have been healed. I understand that I have been reached out to. And therefore, you who have a need you who have an obvious need and are accepting of that need, we minister, showing the healing authority of the Lord Jesus. We've already spoken about secular mercy. There's a hypocrisy in that because ultimately there's no real reason to be kind to your neighbor when you don't believe in an authority. Well, I guess the reason could be you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But sometimes that wears pretty thin. Nonetheless, there's hypocrisy in secular mercy. There's weakness of nominal Christian mercy. There's a weakness in just doing good for the sake of doing good. We're doing good because hopefully the Lord will pay me back. We're doing good because maybe it'll get me some type of good karma. There's a weakness in that because it's totally unbiblical, and there's not enough fuel to keep doing that. But the duty and understanding and fear of the Lord, the compassion of knowing the salvation of God, the understanding of born-again mercy is the fuel of the Holy Spirit that provides and that continues to say, look, you are here for a purpose, to live for the future, to live for the not yet, to live for the one who sees. Therefore, as you have been blessed, as you have been healed, as you know me, so bring me to others. This demonstrates the salvation that we know and the salvation that the kingdom offers. He says, look, I've got to go preach the kingdom of God elsewhere. In verse 42 and 30, 43, the crowd tries to keep him from leaving them. They want him. They want his presence. They want what he represents. They want what he does. Some of them, of course, want him for material reasons. Some of them want him for the true reasons. But he says, I must go and preach the kingdom elsewhere also. The kingdom is something that we should desire. The kingdom is something that we should love. The kingdom is something that we should look for. There should be a craving for it. And on paper, we delight in our Lord. And on paper, we delight in His kingdom. In reality, every church, and even the church as a whole, is often a pale imitation of what it should be. And the reason is people mess things up. Our own selfishness gets in the way. Our own personalities get in the way. There will never be a perfect church this side of glory. But nonetheless, through repentance and through the working of the Spirit, we can make a church more craveable. Instead of letting our own individuality and our own personalities get in the way, we can have a kingdom and a church that is more enjoyable and more craveable by being honest instead of hypocritical. By the power, authority, and character of Christ, we can set about to make the church the sanctuary that it is supposed to be, the respite that it is supposed to be. At work, people are always measuring what you're doing. At work, people are always judging your performance or judging your attitude. Sometimes at home, people are judging your attitude and judging your performance. But the church is supposed to be a sanctuary from that. We're supposed to be able to be honest about our sin and about our flaws. We're supposed to be open about who we are and understand that while we, if we want to be more like Christ, it's okay to talk about who we are and what we're trying to overcome. Phariseeism has dominated Christianity for too long. We need to be a group of real people. People that say, look, I am a sinner. I'm not comparing you to me, for who am I? I've messed up far too many times. I'm no role model. I'm not perfect. God is the one that we all look to, that we all point to. God is the one that we all aim at. God is the one that we are all to be like. Not to tear other people down because they don't meet some mold that we've created. The movement of the Holy Spirit is what should motivate us in our ministries and in our church 
the movement of God placed upon us that says this is where you are to go, not the peer pressure, not the what so-and-so is going to think if I don't say or do this, not the what, the so, what so-and-so is going to say or do if I don't act this way or, or talk this way. No, but the movement of the Holy Spirit is our motivation. And let honesty rule out over hypocrisy. Let grace and mercy rule out over comparison. Humility and tenderness that relies and rests on God's infinite grace rather than a comparison to other people, rather than a comparison to other ministries, rather than a comparison to other goals, rather than looking at what everyone is doing and saying, I should be like that. Let's look to the grace of God. The person says, I wish I was more famous. The person says, I wish I was more attractive. The person says, I wish I was more wealthy, more social. I wish I was more fun. The person says, I wish I was like that person. Why is growing up so hard? Why is dealing with puberty so hard? Because at that age in your life, these things overwhelm a person. The world will crush a person if they don't have the solid grounding of grace, the understanding that God is going to love me no matter what, and my best efforts, my best, my best things are not going to impress Him any more than my worst things are going to cause Him to push, away, push Him away from me. It is totally by the mercy and by the action of the Son of God that I am welcomed and adopted into His family and totally accepted. He does not compare me to my brothers or sisters. And he does not set up a checklist of do's and don'ts. And he does not measure out my day at the end of each day before I go to sleep and say, oh, a few more points over here, a few less points over here, and you'll be okay. No, that's no way to live, and that is not what the gospel offers. That is not what the kingdom offers. The kingdom is to be craveable because with the kingdom, we just love the Lord and seek his face. Look to his understanding and allow him to move and direct us. There's a freedom to live in this kingdom over the fear and the unknowns. There's a freedom. I don't know what will be coming. And if I had to live like I was responsible for all the variables of the future, it would be the most oppressed, slavish life one could imagine. If I were responsible for the way that the future twisted and turned. People live that way. The Christian is not called to live that way. The Christian is to say, I know my Lord. I know salvation. I know eternal life. Why do, why do people who love the Lord Jesus want to be around him? Not the ones we read about last week that wanted to push him off the cliff, but the people who knew him for what he was and who he was. They found him attractive and they craved him. Because of that freedom and that peace that he gave. This was not a person who was going to make you feel bad about yourself. This was not a person who was going to make you feel uncomfortable. This was a person who you could be honest with. Not in a... Not in a um, not in a way that the world offers, where everything is just perfect and celebrate your sin. I don't mean that. But in a way that embraces you and welcomes you and enables you to want to be more like your Lord. And that is the kingdom of God. And that is what we crave. And that is what we have the opportunity to build and work towards. The kingdom of God would be so much more real if these things and these were made more and were made more and more uh, consistent in our churches. We are free, but we live like we are most entangled with the yoke of bondage so much of our time. And so let's embrace the freedom that Christ has given us and say, be gone to the evil influences. Be gone to the spirits that seek to crush us and hold us down. Be gone to the illnesses that thwart us and think, make us think there is no hope or make us think that this life is all we have. Let's repent and glorify our Savior and point to Him 
and make him the light and make him the objective. Salvation is a gloriously good thing. Salvation is something of magnificent peace. Let's demonstrate that and demonstrate his glory by his grace, filled with his love, knowing his mercy, enjoying him forever. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you have sent your Savior, that you are Savior. Thank you that we know the peace of the kingdom. May the authority of Christ cast out the evil. May the authority of Christ cast out the illness. May we live for the not yet that is full of his great wonder and his great security. And may we, by his grace, build a kingdom that is delightful and that is craveable. May we be a church that embodies the character of the Lord Jesus. And may we demonstrate that salvation in love. And may we joy in the Lord. We ask the application of this, we plead it, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you once again to take your hymnals. Stand together and turn to number 523.